I'll, uh, I'll say something right off the bat here. Um, my, my sister's case is very much an unsolved murder. It is very much a cold case, active investigation. Um, so I know there's a book out there that says there's a theory that this guy did it, Luke Gregoire. Uh, that's just a theory. Um, it's nothing that has been, um, conclusively determined. Um, and then a couple episodes ago, we were talking about a folie, folie a deux, um, and, and the idea that, uh, older guy, younger guy, Luke Gregoire, uh, the father of the Pouliot family could have been this folie a deux. Uh, and I want to be really clear about that. I don't, I do not believe that. I think something like that happened, but not that. That was just an example. <clears throat> so let's, let's clear, uh, clear the air <laughs> there. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, the other thing I would say, so, yeah, so in, in something like that happening, uh, and all this emphasis on, um, on, um, bikers, uh, Quebec bikers in the 70s, 60s, uh, I've said it many, many times, old windbag here has said this many times that, um, uh, I, I don't have a particular interest in biker culture. Uh, I don't really give a rat's ass about it. Nevertheless, uh, circumstances have compelled me to be interested in it. Um, so I, I, I am not going to spend the next year uh, going over again every specific detail of, of biker lore and the biker history in Quebec. I, that's... I, that's uh, it's super cool. It's not my game. Um, if, if you want to know, you know, where this is, uh, where this is leading, um, it's, it's not leading there. Um, my interest is in a few specific, um, low level, uh, uh, figures in the biker world. Uh, you know, maybe a hanger on or two and that's it. And, uh, to be, to be perfectly clear, cause the palette of listeners here is diverse. Uh, I am not going uh, much farther beyond 1985. If you catch my drift, I'm not going into the late 80s, nothing about bikers in the 90s and into the 2000s. It's not my game. It's not my fight. Uh, and we're not going there. So with that, I would say, you know, I, I hope I'm painting a picture here and that some of this is coming slowly into focus uh, in my own meandering way. This is Who Killed Teresa. So we had been talking about uh, the SICO report, the uh, bikers of Quebec, and uh, a listener pointed out quite rightly that, uh, you, you know, they, they study um, these biker cultures in a variety of, of cities, but they somehow, <laughs> it's a 1980 report, they, they managed to avoid... Um, the hive of biker culture in the 70s, that is Montreal, Laval, Sorel, Tracy. And I drew a map of it. I drew a map of what they're studying, and I put it on the website, theresalore.com, T-H-E-R-E-S-A-A-L-L-O-R-E.com. And, you know, their, their, their focus groups go all the way up the St. Lawrence uh almost, you know, right to Anacostia Island and, and all along the St. Lawrence, you know, those small towns, uh, 
Monjoli, Satils, etc. But they, <laughs> asbestos, Sherbrooke, but they managed to right to stop, right, <laughs> right around Sorel, Tracy, um, and 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 Laval, which were the traditional heads of the the north and south chapters of the of the Hell's Angels, um, and 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 as this uh, and as this reader commented, you know, no one's a ever been able to provide an explanation about why that was. And just let that hang there. Um, but I, I, I would, I would say, you know, where is this going? In, in order to understand biker problems, uh, you have to know the bikers, and it's it's not enough to rattle off a bunch of funny names like the Sex Foxes of Shibugamu or the Pecker Woods, uh, and then conclude, well, there you have it. That's the bikers. I I would argue which bikers specifically. And when and where are you talking about them specifically? You know, it's it's one thing to say, well, the bikers were probably peddling drugs in local schools and colleges. It's quite another to have a government report that documents from town to town that actual activity. So, uh, for example, I'll get to some of what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, we know from the SECO report that um, bikers in St. Gideon, that region in the 1970s, they, they were called the, the missiles, the missiles. Uh, and uh, the report even documents that I put them on last week's post. Many photographs of their headquarters, the interior of their headquarters, the weapons they carried, etc., and, and we even, we know the names of these people because Seco tells us the names and they are, uh, according to the report, uh, Luc Michaud, known as Bardot, Michel Guernard, known as Canard, uh, Richard Poudre, known as Filterer, Guy Cossette, Souris, Jerry, Jerry Calombe, Le Chat, Jocelyn Gérard, Le Prof, Marcel Blackburn, Pilpon, Jean-Yves Tremblay, Bébé, Gaetan Lavoie, Yeti, Roland Cosino, Mannix, nice one, Mannix, Alain Gérard, L'Ours, Bear, The Bear. So we know we know the names. Um, and we also know that in, in 1976, so again, 76, we have this point of intersection that we've talked about. Just before the start of the Olympic Games, Montrealers Jocelyn Baudouin and René Lassard set out on a camping adventure to the Saguenay. And one of the last confirmed sightings of these two young women was at St. Gideon. In fact, uh, they were thought to be seen in the company of bikers near uh, Rivière de Loup. Uh, and, and one of the theories is that Baudouin and Lassard were murdered by bikers. Um, and if you need more on that story, we did an entire podcast on it a couple of years ago. Um, you can find that on the website. Um, so what I, what, what fundamentally, what I would say is 46 years later, these murders are still unsolved. There was an article in La Presse about it a couple of months ago that basically just you know, re retraced the same old information. I guess I, I guess it was a 45 anniversary article, right? Time ticks at these markers, 45, 50, 55, 60, etc. And everyone feels compelled to talk about it again. But nobody really uh, feels that compelled to do a fucking thing about it. Um, but hey, I got an idea. Quebec has... Uh, a cold case unit, in fact, several cold case units now. And the theory was that bikers were involved. And 
we have the names of people known to be or have been bikers in that era or thought to have been bikers in that area. So wouldn't uh, it just, you know, make logical sense um, to, to, to track down these people, these names, uh, figure out who's dead, who's still alive, um, and maybe interview or, or if you're optimistic, re-interview these people. And, uh, hey, listen, I know, I know the argument here is it's like, hey, John, it's desperate. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Well, and I say yes and no. I say, I say no because it's Quebec and little changes there. Yeah. Your haystack's not that big. You're, you're looking, you're not looking for a needle. You're looking for an all. And yes, it seems desperate. Decades have passed. People are dead or they're close to it. Uh, so what's the point? Well, the point is that Quebec has set up cold case units to fulfill exactly this mandate, precisely to solve this problem. It doesn't matter that it's difficult. Go do what the public resourced you to accomplish. Simple. So that's my my point. I'm uh, I'm just going to read <clears throat> and then talk a little bit about one chapter in the SECO report, the 1980 report, um, about the biker gangs of Sherbrooke. <clears throat> and, and you can see that when we talk about biker gangs in the 70s in Sherbrooke, we are mostly talking about two groups, the Adams and the Gitans. And I, and I say this because I know there's a whole lot of names thrown out there and they all get mixed up in, in the washing machine of my head, the devil's disciples and Satan's choice and the Popeyes and then they became the hells and then there's the, the, there's the outlaws. But hold on, are you talking about the, the, the biker group, the outlaws from the Chicago area or are you talking about outlaw bikers because those are two different things i know i know it's it's fucking ridiculous so for now we're we're just going to focus on what we can nail down and what we can nail down in this early era say pre-75 there were two groups the adams and the gitans <clears throat> so this this is uh the sherbrooke chapter in Sherbrooke, the activities of two motorcycle clubs drew our attention. We held in camera hearings between June 18th and October 18th, 1979, 14 sessions. 47 witnesses were heard and 104 exhibits produced. From the start of the hearings, there was a great deal of acceleration among motorcyclists in Sherbrooke and the surrounding area, but our work has enabled us to better understand the extent of the phenomenon, to analyze the numerous allegations of crimes, and finally to recommend to the Attorney General that charges be brought against individuals. Section 1. History. In Sherbrooke, the Gypsies and the Adams share the same territory which has given rise to deadly conflicts between the two clubs. Thus, during 1973-74, when the two factions were heavily armed, there were frequent scuffles, several bloody ones. There were six murders during this troubled period. Finally, at the beginning of the year 1975, during a meeting of the presidents of the Gypsies and the Adams, <clears throat> Chitans is the French word for gypsies. As well as their deputies, we succeeded in finding a modus vivendi. The two clubs now manage to coexist smoothly, <laughs> although there is still uh, enmity between uh, Gitans and Adams. Section 2, the Gitans. Before 1970, the Gitans were called the Dirty Reich. 
Remember, that name will go back to it. The club was then led by and denounced Jacques Filto Bobo. He is still the leader, even if officially it is Georges Bellieu, Boboy, who calls himself president. The Jetans Club had about 20 members at the time of the club wars, and now about 15, whose names are Georges Beaulieu, Boboy, president, Jacques Filteau, Bobo, the one who rules all, Claude Filteau, Vic, or Victor, Charles Filteau, Cash, André Jacob, Dédé, Jacques Aimant, Israël, Pierre Auclair, Sapeur, or Sap, Daniel Drouin, Dan, Yvon Tanguay, Bagos, Guy Auclair, Junior, Robert Tremblay, Coleuvre, Luger Gagnon, Buck, Gaetan Berger, Ticoun, Yves Savoie, Bellotte, and Réal L'Esperance, Yogi. Hostilities between the Jetans and the Adams arose with the arrival in the sector of a man named Yves Bouteau, the boss, who liaised with the Popeyes of Montreal, who have since become Hell's Angels. Bouteau was a member of the Hell's Angels, with whom he never failed the occasion to support the Jetans. There are also two Popeyes, Maurice Auger, Le Grec, and Michel Roy, who were suppliers of weapons to the Gitans and even to the Atoms. These two clubs have always been heavily armed with rifles, revolvers, and military weapons. The Gitans displayed their harshness through their repulsive and ragged exteriors. One of theirs describes some sordid initiation sessions to us. Another witness informed us about the lifestyles of the Jetans at 584 Rue Montréal in Sherbrooke. Despite complaints from neighbors, the building owner was unable to drive them away. Section 3. The Atoms These bikers behave like the Jetans. They occupy a room rented by Daniel Carrier, Le Jeune, on Rue Wellington in Sherbrooke. The immediate neighbors sought to move away from them. <laughs> Who wants to get away from the bikers? The Atoms have 13 members. Their president, Réjean Gilbert, seeks harmony between the biker clubs of Estrie. Here are their names. Réjean Gilbert, farmer, president. Réjean Adams, Adam, Vice President. Ronald Seguin, Big. Yvon Lecour, Castro. Daniel Lincor, Béon. Daniel Carrier, Le Jeune. Michel Fortier, Ballon. Allaire Grodin. Regis Lachance, Chinois. Christina Lacour, Kiki, Jacques Lacour, Coco, Christian Terrien, Bouquin, Jacques Leclerc, Festus. Narcotics. <laughs> Jetans and Adams are especially preoccupied with drugs, the trade of which gives rise to many crimes. From 1976 to 1979, the Jetans took control of a licensed establishment located in Rock Forest. They terrorized the owners, their employees, even their children. The bartender had to turn a blind eye to the drug trade in the establishment or face reprisals. The Jetans are so masters of the place that they themselves filter the customers. 
They forbade access, for example, to citizens who displeased them and to people of black races. Witnesses described to us the drug circuit among the Jitans, the sources of supply and the networks of pushers who were busy in particular at the Bistro and the Hotel Gaspé in Sherbrooke. A student admitted his activities of being a pusher on behalf of the Jitans. He supplied the children of the Moncom school and the young strollers of Rue Wellington and Sherbrooke. As for its suppliers, they are operated in two discotheques, La Fer and Le Triolet, by selling pot for $30 an ounce. The same student was taking delivery of the drugs from a bar in Rock Forest, where one of the Jetans was permanently present seven days a week. Two Jetans assaulted those who objected to their business. Another individual admitted to having sold drugs to the Jetans at the beginning of 1976. One day, when he was trying to get a clientele at the Moulin Rouge at the Hotel Gaspé, with the agreement of the Jetans, he was beaten by bikers, members of the Marauders Club of Asbestos. They even shot him in another circumstance. He had entered the territory already served by the marauders of asbestos. He had to cease his activities. The Jitans also got their supplies of narcotics from the Hells. Given their close relationship with Yves Bouteau, Le Boss, and Yves Bilibo, Goril, a biker revealed the tricks used to outsmart customs officials and police officers during the transport of drugs. According to the treasurer of the Jitans, the club's business is booming. A loan of $10,000 had even been granted to a merchant in Sherbrooke. Selling narcotics in nightclubs and billiard halls paid off big every night. A Waterville hotelier had to close his establishment following the trouble he caused the Jitans. They would consume drugs on the spot sometimes at the same time as members of the Adams, which caused fights and helped to drive out regular clientele. Sexual Assaults So many witnesses had convinced us that bikers from the Adams Club have raped minors and infected them, that we asked the police to complete their investigations so that the suspects answer for their acts in court. A 16-year-old drugged girl was sexually assaulted. In this circumstance, a biker would have sold her for money to members of the club. Another minor, under the threat of a beating, had to have sex in front of the bikers. She would then have contracted a venereal disease. She told us that all the girls who had relations with a biker she named were also infected. Another young girl was forced to be sexually assaulted by seven Adams bikers that same night under threats of beatings. Several other minors were trained in the biker room to be abused. Allegations of crime. Some witnesses recounted a certain number of crimes for which the police forces are working to complete the necessary proof. A. In 1978, two bikers allegedly stole a considerable number of motorcycles, which they were immediately reselling. B. Two bikers attacked homosexuals they were attracting and then robbed them. C. Assaulting, stabbing, August 2, 1978, in Magog. D. In 1976, theft of $30,000 at Farbstein's and $40,000 at Electrolux. E. Young people stole social welfare checks from letterboxes on behalf of the Jitans, who had them cashed in the banks by young girls. F. Three motorcyclists specialized in theft of sales. They would have succeeded in about 30. G. At the Jitans Club, we found about 100 forms, birth certificates, driver's license, registrations, and credit cards, that were sold for between $25 and $100. Uh, 
which leads to the next section, the police. On the whole, the police force of the city of Sherbrooke was up to the situation, especially during the last two years preceding this investigation. To this end, the patrollers joined forces, organized regular visits to biker premises, and carried out frequent checks on the road. <laughs> Some police officers have received threats. The authorities of the city of Sherbrooke have passed a bylaw banning motorcycles on Wellington Street, a favorite spot for bikers for drug trafficking. Uh, there's so much to unpack there. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> let's, uh, we'll do that. Let's just get to the conclusion because I assure you it's brief. Conclusion. The small number of charges that the commission can recommend is due on the one hand to the fact that a large number of criminal acts were not reported to the police in a timely manner. And on the other, struck by fear of reprisals from victims and witnesses, as well as by the law of silence among bikers. So <clears throat> that's, a, that's a synopsis uh, of the landscape of the Adams and Jatins biker gangs in the 1970s in Sherbrooke, Quebec. And one of the first things we learn is that the headquarters of the Jatins was at 584 Rue Montreal. And this is very interesting. This location is just... Uh, off Belvedere in Sherbrooke. Um, it's about uh, a five-minute walk from the headquarters of the Sherbrooke Hussars, where uh, where Luc Gregoire may have worked, where Louise Cameron, the victim, definitely worked. Uh, so if you know your geography from this story, that is compelling. And we also learned from this report that the the Adams were not very far away. Uh, it says they occupied a room rented by Daniel Carrier, Le Jean, en Rue, Wellington. And that's about a 15-minute walk from the Jetins headquarters. And this is the neighborhood where Luc Gregoire was living in 1981, where he committed a rape in a downtown parking lot off Belvedere, uh, and during the same period, he robbed a gas station on Rue Wellington. Um, so it is all within that very, very tight landscape. But we're we're getting a, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. We'll we'll return to that. What I would would uh, would add to this is that by 1980, it appears that the Jatans were asserting dominance over the over the Adams. Um, they were supplied by the Hells Angels out of Montreal. Uh, they controlled establishments in Rock Forest, uh, and we've heard that name before. Uh, they supplied drugs to a high school three minutes away from, from their headquarters, the Ecole uh, Mitchell Montcalm, which is right up on Portland. Uh, Portland is where Louise Cameron worked at the hospital. Uh, uh, Montcalm High School uh, is the high school where Luc Gregoire was thought to have attended. Um, so both groups are vying for control of the drug trade among the clubs in downtown Sherbrooke as well. Places like uh, the Bistro, Le Phare, uh, Le Triolet, and the Moulin Rouge uh, along the Wellington Hotel, Moulin Rouge, which was in the, in the, uh, in the hotel. Um, very famous. I think. I think. I think that that was just demolished last year, finally. Um, and then finally, we al we also learn of biker activity, curiously, in a remote town called Waterville. Probably get to Waterville uh, later. It's um, we not talked a lot about Waterville, but it, it, it's in an interesting place. It's halfway between uh, Compton and uh, and Sherbrooke. This little, I, I actually drew, drove through it when I was there in December because I've been through it before, but it's been a while since I've been there, and I, I sort of know I know a little more information about Waterville now, so I wanted to kind of see it from my own hand. Uh, if you were, you know, just if depending how deeply you've gone into this, if if you 
if you were a Champlain college student in 1978-79 and you were staying at the residence in Compton, so 214 students in that place, and you had access to a car, it, it was common, like on a weekend, to drive to Waterville to drink, to party. Um, and now we have the confirmation that, that there was a party culture going on there because we have the Chitans and the Adams in, in, in a club there that is now verified by this report. And that, and that narrative of students going there is, is, was originally suggested in uh, police, police interviews with students and post uh, Teresa's disappearance. So we have that very interesting connection of traffic going through uh, from Compton to Waterville and then on up to Sherbrooke. And I guess, and I guess, finally, the, the thing we learned is that um, bikers uh, frequently smuggle drugs across the Canadian-U.S. border. We hear this, you know, and that they found ways to smuggle drugs in that report. So um, I'm sure they would smuggle drugs in any way, anywhere possible. But it, uh, it's in addition to the well-tread narrative that all drugs come through the St. Lawrence ports. Um, that's traditionally what you hear, and that's not the case. Drugs were coming by boat, by by car, by plane, um, any means uh, you could get your hands on. There's 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 a ton of names cataloged here, and, and uh, uh, apologies for the tedium of reading them all, um, but I also printed them all. You know that's by design, that's deliberate. Uh, you know I'm not going to go into every name now. We, we may. We may spend some time on them shortly. We may discover things. Um, the the one that sticks out like a like a, a short thumb is the Jetons president, Georges Beaulieu, sometimes referred to as uh, Bow Boy or Boy Boy, mis incorrectly Boy Boy and Bow Boy. It is correct. And as I say, who knows? Maybe we'll we'll. Uh, We'll discover more about some of these characters as we make our, our journey here along uh, through uh, Quebexico. Quebec um, but but for now, what I what I would say to sum up, it, it, it appears that um, that bikers controlled all criminal elements in Sherbrooke, uh, that they were running drugs into the schools, that they were heavily armed with military grade weapons. They, that they brutalized women at will. Yet the SECO report, uh, Mark andre Bedard's report, on behalf of the Quebec government, concluded that police were doing a good job and, quote, up to the situation, whatever the hell that means, demonstrated by the passage of a bylaw banning motorcycles from city streets. <laughs> this is who killed Teresa. Some housekeeping, I, I guess, is in order. If um, if you like the podcast, uh, please say you like it on uh, social media platforms. The best avenue for that is iTunes. Give it a five-star review on, on uh, iTunes. That's always very, very nice. Uh, if you want more information, go to the website, TeresaLore.com, T-H-E-R-E-S-A-A-L-L-O-R-E.com. There's all kinds of information there. There's the uh, the, the narrative um, from today's uh, podcast. I've got um, all kinds of uh, photos here uh, today, as I said, alluded to at the beginning, the map, um, some pages from the report, um, an interesting photo for, of uh, Georges Beaulieu, uh, which uh, we will discuss in detail uh, next time uh, an interesting um, uh, ad I found um, from a newspaper uh, Quebec I think it's from uh, Le Tribune uh, it's 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 telling you what's on at the cinema in Sherbrooke in, in 1968 uh, the biker film Angels from Hell was playing at the Granada on Rue Wellington um, there's a photo of uh, Ils sont psycho cycle. 
Angels from Hell en couleur. Uh, uh, playing on a double bill with three in the attic. Deux dernières jours. There's only two days left, people. You gotta come see it. So this, and a bunch of bikers here with like Nazi helmets on, uh, living up to their reputation. Um, so that's, that's, that's an interesting little, little nugget. Uh, the Gren Grenada 53 Wellington. So that was right, that was right down there in the heart of it. Uh, right where we're talking about today. Uh, you can find that on the website. Um, yeah, follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we always add interesting clues and additions to the stories, to the subjects we're following here on the, on, on the podcast, uh, as always. And um, the website is Trevor tre Treasure Trove of Information. You can go there and kind of get lost in the case history, etc. archives. Uh, I haven't said it a long uh, while. Um, please follow us on Substack. If you don't know what Substack is, it's, it's kind of like a GoFundMe, except I'm not asking for any lucre at this point. You can, you can, you can sign up for free. Just give your email. I think it's Substack, John Allure, slash John Allure, or something like that. You can find it. You can find it on the website. Um, that's where you can get the newsletter. Um, you know, no matter, uh, where you, you know, what your point of entry is here, whether it's the website or Substack or the podcast, uh, they're all meant to complement each other. Uh, they all have slightly different uh, messages. And uh, the only way you get the full picture is uh, sneaky me. If, if <laughs> you know, you, you are engaged with all three of them, certain, you know, certain platforms will omit certain things um, that's my devious little little scheme here but you don't have to do that you can just come in every week and listen and then go away that's totally cool too you won't miss anything uh, it's just for the it's just for the diehards if you have information on any of the cases we talk about here we talked today about uh, Rene Lassard or uh, Rene Lassard uh, Jocelyn Baudouin you can contact the Sarté du Québec at Central Information Criminelle, CIC, uh, at CIC at Sarté, S U R E T E, point Q C, point C A, it's their email, or at 1 800 659 4264. All conversations information are confidential. That's it. That's it. Uh, I'm going to shut up and move on uh, and try and have a great, great day, as I hope you have a great, great day. This is Who Killed Teresa, and I'm John Elor. Thanks for listening. <laughs>